Welcome to the Western Bell podcast series with talks on traditional spiritual teaching and its application in the world today. The intention of the series is to offer something useful for those who are drawn to study themselves and engage practice on the spiritual path. New talks are posted twice each month. The content of the talks is for informational purposes only and not to provide any kind of counseling, medical, or professional advice. This podcast is titled, Writing as a Transformational Path. The presentation was given by Mary Angelon Young and Regina Sarah Ryan on March 19th, 2022, via Zoom. The speakers discuss possibilities of the practice of writing, along with personal experiences of what they have learned about writing from their teacher, Lee Lossowick. Both Angelon and Regina are editors, workshop leaders, and authors who have written extensively during over 40 years that each has purposefully been on the spiritual path. A partial list of Angelon's books include As It Is, Under the Punai Tree, Enlightened Duality with Lee Lossowick, and The Art of Contemplation. And of Regina's books include Only God, the Woman Awake, Praying Dangerously, and Igniting the Inner Life. Toward the end of the talk, they offer two writing exercises. If you would like to participate in the same exercises while listening to the podcast, feel free to pause the recording and spend a few minutes writing. If there is benefit in this talk for you, please consider sharing the link to it or writing a review on social media or on one of the podcast platforms. Angelon Young speaks first, followed by Regina Ryan. It is such a pleasure to be here tonight with you and to talk about the joy of writing as a spiritual practice and as an actual uh, road that we can walk, a path that we can walk of personal transformation, of course, for the good of all, because all of our personal transformation work benefits all beings and is entirely graceful. So we're really happy to be here with you. And Regina and I are both published authors and longtime editors. We have a great love of the craft and the art and the creativity of writing and what that can mean for us in our spiritual journey. For me, I didn't really start writing until my teacher, Lee, asked me to write for him. I was trained in psychotherapy and had had many different iterations of different lifetimes in this one lifetime prior to really starting my sadhana in writing. And once it got started, it just took hold of me. It's like the muse came to live with me and she won't let me go. So I'm very, very passionate about writing as Regina is. So I'm happy to be here with you to talk about it a little bit tonight. So why do we want to take up this particular sadhana, this particular spiritual work of writing as a spiritual practice, as an inroad into who we truly are to access the inner resources and the wisdom and the essential knowledge that resides deep within us that we don't really have access to a lot unless we're willing to do different kinds of work to work through the veils the blocks, the obstacles to that inner wisdom. So that is the reason why we do it. And going back to the early Greek masters, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, know thyself. This is where we began in writing practice because writing practice will not mean very much to us, whether we're writing a journal, a memoir, a novel, a nonfiction piece, a biography of someone, whatever genre or engagement we have with writing, it will not mean much. It will not go very deep and it will not have transformational possibility for us as an individual if we're not deeply plumbing the truth of who we are and finding out what that is. So writing is an inroad into our deepest self. It has a great deal to teach us and a lot to discover about who we are. Some of it's painful, of course, because we're all wounded. We all have wounds that we carry. We all have obstacles and blocks and big challenges and things that we work with over the arc of an entire lifetime. It's a lifetime piece of work 
Everybody has this. Writing has this possibility to help us have a practical inroad. Anybody can do it. You do not have to be a skilled writer to engage the practice of writing. However, if you ever take a workshop with Regina and me, you will hear the value of what it can do for your writing when you do take on the art and the craft of working with the language that you're working with. For us, it's the English language. We have people come to our workshops who France is their first language or German or Tamil maybe on rare occasion, but whatever it is, the language that you're working with, there's a beauty and a perfection and an art and a craft in relationship to that language. And there's no substitute for doing that if you want to really, really go for it. However, if you don't, you can engage a spiritual practice of writing without developing those kinds of skills. One of the things that writing can do for us is it can open the doors to a direct experience of reality because when we write and we write from a very honest place and we're really speaking our truest voice, whatever it is in the moment, there's a way in which it brings us into the present moment in a way that's very powerful and very empowering. It may shake us to the core of who we are. It may make our bones rattle a little bit because we're telling the truth. Maybe we're telling a truth we never told before, but we're telling the truth. And it's like Jesus said a long time ago, the truth will set you free. So this is just the basic baseline of why we want to write and why we do any sadhana in spiritual life is for our own liberation, clarity, to free ourselves so that we might serve life, that we might serve the divine in a greater capacity for the benefit of all. And we'll come back to that again and again tonight. So one of the things that we do when we write is we're taking refuge in our creativity. Creativity is so important. It's always been important. It's important in all times, in all places. And now, even more so than ever, we live in a world that seems to be spinning out of control. Now we have a war in Ukraine. We've got climate change. We have all kinds of problems, economic problems, social problems, social injustice. So being able to take refuge in creativity in a way that is enlivening, that's truth-telling, that frees us to actually find the joy in the cracks between our sorrows. And I'm quoting my teacher here, a line from a lyric, a song that he wrote. It's called Death by Music. Find the joy in the cracks between my sorrows. This is what we do with creativity, whether it's cooking a meal or reading a story to a child or the creativity of our chosen field of work, whatever that is. It can be business. It can be painting. It can be anything, really. But the creative spark, that in us, which allows us to tap into a flow, a flow of life. It's so beautiful when that happens. And we all know it. Riding our bicycles, we can tap that flow. And it's so freeing, Mm -hmm. so enlivening, so nourishing, because it connects us to ourselves, and it connects us to reality, and it connects us to nature, actually. So taking refuge in creativity, and this can open the doors to revelation and wonder for us. Scientists are doing all kinds of research now on so many cool fronts, and wonder is one of them. They're discovering that wonder, actually moments of wonder, just like looking at the sunrise and maybe we want to write about it that morning. It's so beautiful. We want to describe it in our journal for the morning. It's an act of praise, actually, praise of the creation, of the beauty that the divinity has created here. This sense of wonder is actually encouraging our body and releasing a whole bunch of hormones, dopamine and all of that kind of thing, that lift our mood. And so writing is one of the inroads, the joy of being able to actually describe something for yourself being able to describe who you are, to describe what you feel, to describe what you're experiencing, your direct experience of reality, to put it into words. It's very, very powerful. And it can actually lift our mood and be, as I was saying, a a place of refuge because of that, because we're tapping wonder. 
it's a tremendously powerful way of working with change and uncertainty, being able to go back to our journal or back to our piece of writing that we're working on or something that we're reflecting deeply on for ourselves. Because as we're writing, we actually find out that we know things or that there's wisdom within us that we didn't know was there. But it's suddenly just coming out. You know, the muse, the muse takes you and start writing, no editing, no censoring, no, like you should not be doing it this way, letting yourself be free because nobody else is going to be reading it but you if you're journaling. Now, writing, of course, a book to publish, it's very similar, but also very different. So you allow yourself to do these things and we get to find out what is it that I know that I didn't know. I can hear my own voice. This uh, depth of discovery, actually, discovering what is my voice? What is my unique offering here in life? I can appreciate someone else's unique offering because it's different than mine. But mine has a certain quality, a certain flavor, a certain rasa, a certain mood, a certain nectar to it. So we can use writing as a way to stabilize and ground ourselves during times of change and uncertainty like we have now. And a way to work with the suffering that's in the world, that we can express it to ourselves and we can actually give voice to it and let that voice lead us to the deeper place where we do have refuge, where we can accept, where we can say yes to what is. So these are very deep spiritual principles that I'm touching base on really quickly here, because normally when Regina and I give workshops, we spend three days talking about these things and getting more specific into it. We have an hour and a half tonight. Another aspect of writing, if you've ever engaged any of the practices of the tantric path, for example, writing is a wonderful tool when it comes to tantric practice. Because in Tantra, we turn toward our experience. We don't run away from it and say, no, 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 I can't deal with it. I can't handle it. We turn toward it and we embrace it and we go, what is this? And we bring curiosity and we bring an openness, open heart, open eyes, open mind to our experience. And this is a very, very, very fruitful place to practice on the spiritual path. Another thing that happens when we're writing is that we begin to cultivate presence. We're tuning into our own voice. We're tuning into the wisdom that's deep within us, deep, deep underneath all the layers of personality and obstacles and karmas under there in the deep well. We're tapping into that. We're developing this capacity of awareness of the moment, literally even learning how to describe the sunrise, going back to that, because it's very easy. We love the sunrise, right? Most of us do. Just bringing the full awareness to the sunrise, describing it, being present 100% to the sunrise. This is a very powerful business. It's really simple. It's very powerful. And we have to actually engage it. So it's a wonderful way into the present moment, writing. I want to just share a couple of quotes with you before I stop. Regina's going to talk to you for a while about writing. This is a quote from Swami Ram Das. He was the guru of Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar, who was the guru of Lee Laswick. Ram Das says, Every bit of experience of pain, sorrow, loss, failure, and disappointment has its invaluable use for the soul in its onward march towards truth. So this is one of the things where we began with writing is being able to tell the truth about our experience. We might need to spend a long time writing about things that happened to us long ago in order to get to what's happening now. But we're bringing those things into the present moment and being present to them now in a way that's healing and integrating. So there's this healing quality to our writing. Every bit of experience of pain, sorrow, loss, failure, and disappointment has its invaluable use for the soul in its onward march towards truth. A couple of other quotes I want to share with you. Everybody has a story. 
you know, all that pain and loss and disappointment that Ram Dass is referring to, that's part of our story. I have mine, you have yours, everybody's got one. And it's not just a bunch of meaningless, self-absorbed stuff that we want to get rid of. There's actually some jewels in there. If we can integrate and digest fully our experience in life, then it becomes wisdom. And writing is all about that. If we're writing a memoir, if we're writing a journal, if we're writing a nonfiction book, we are integrating our life experience and it's being alchemized through the process of writing, through the discipline and the power of the word. It is being alchemized into wisdom. So one of my favorite fantasy writers going back to the 70s, Ursula K. Le Guin, she wrote At the Left Hand of Darkness, which is a groundbreaking book in the genre of fantasy. And she wrote a number of other books. She says, story is our only boat for sailing on the river of time. So there's a way that we can use the practice of writing to engage the story of our lives in a way that makes it meaningful and useful to us in the spiritual journey. That we don't have to reject all of that, that we can actually integrate it and become one with it. and make use of it. It becomes then useful, not only for ourselves, because the bottom line of personal transformation is that it's all about the totality. It's all about transformation here in this individual and that it benefits all beings, that it benefits the whole of life. So I'm looking forward to hearing what Regina is going to be sharing with you. Thank you, Mary. Welcome, Regina. Thank you. We really don't plan a whole lot of what we're going to do. We really just want to listen to one another and then speak from our own passion and experience. So a group of us were sitting around and we were sharing about some aspects of the Dharma that were really exciting for us. And one man read this beautiful poem that Lee had written Lee wrote poems in praise of his guru, Yogi Ram Surat Kumar. He called them poems and prayers, prayers and praise. He'd sit during meditation and he'd write. He'd sit on trains and write. He'd be in the car and writing. He'd pull the van over and write something. He'd write in between a band gig when he was singing rock and roll. He'd be writing poems to Yogi Ram Surat Kumar. And Many people have their theories about how it was just channeled through him and he was pure devotion and it just was the overflowing of his devotion. And I also believed that I could see that. But I also, from the very beginning, knew from my own experience, his practice of giving himself a blank page and a pen and just a subject, a prompt. The prompt was this incredible being, Yogi Ram Surat Kumar. That was his prompt. And he could, he could look around and see a bird sitting on a windowsill and start with that and write a poem of praise to Yogi Ram Surat Kumar. He could hear the rain falling on the roof and he could turn that into a poem of praise to Yogi Ram Surat Kumar. And because I'm a writer, because I have been a writer ongoingly in my life, I know what that kind of writing does for my mood, for my clarity, for my devotion, for strengthening my intention. And I don't need to know that Lee was already the devotee par excellence of Yogi Ram Surat Kumar. All I have to do is see that he created for himself a practice that built, I say, it built his devotion. It expanded his love. It took this small flame in his heart and it took it out to everything in creation. I know this is possible because it's happened to me and I'm sure it's happened to some of you. The best way I know it recently is that I love to write letters. I don't like to write my personal feelings to people through email. I find that it just doesn't quite express it, but I love to write personal letters. 
And if I sit down and I address a letter, my darling niece, Isabel, the latest letter I just wrote, and I just let myself think of her and begin to express to her how it was to be with her a few weeks ago. By the time I'm finished writing that letter, I'm with her. I'm loving her. I'm bonded to her. Whatever was going on, I had a million things to do, but I gave myself that time to stop and just hold her. And I was able to actually just unfold my love for her. And it didn't have to be something super artistic. I could just say, you know, when we exchanged earrings with each other, it was like we were just exchanging our hearts to one another. Some way in which some little event had happened with us. So, of course, we can keep all of these things in our minds. We can keep them silently to ourselves. We can use them for our prayer. But there's something about the writing process whereby we pull a thread out of the sky, a little thread. I, I'd love to love my guru more. I'd love to express to my niece just how much I'm with her in this hard time in her life. I'd love to be able to just capture that sunset in a way that I can look at it again. So we pull that little thread out and we take the needle of our pen or our fingers, whatever we're using, and we thread that needle. And once it's threaded, we can sew a garment. We can create. We can create something that endures like Lee did with poems to Yogi Ram Surat Kumar. And at the same time that he was creating those, I think, this is the Regina theory of Lee's writing those poems, I think that Lee was not necessarily an expressive devotional type. He was much more interior and that he was using this writing process as a way to fan the fires of his love for his guru. So for me, writing has the possibility of transformation from flat existence into expanded multicolored existence. I know that from the experience I have had in writing prayers, that I have actually established for myself a prayer book that I can use in times of trouble, that I could actually write myself through depression. I could write myself through anguish. I could also write myself through ecstasy and devotion. And that I actually have now a book of prayers that I can say on a regular basis or I can go to when I need them. For me, this is one other way in which writing can serve for me as a transformational apparatus, a transformational vehicle. Mary was saying how much Lee encouraged our writing, her writing, and, and she was also saying how when the truth is finally written, how valuable that is for us. And Lee taught me a very strong lesson, which some of you may have heard. I went to the Parliament of World Religions in 1993, and I wrote letters to Lee from the Parliament in which I told him in letter after letter what was going on day by day. Oh, you'd never believe it. This big guru came in and he was doing this. And then we went to see this one and everybody was bowing down and we were loving this and we were hating this. And he just loved it because I knew that kind of writing really enlivened him. And then when I came home from the parliament, he said to me, write an article that we can share with everybody. So I took all of my letters or the notes I had made from my letters, and I wrote this really lovely, intelligent, polished, nice and reverent article about the Parliament of World Religions. And I handed it to him to be published. And he read it and he said, in very nice words, he said, this is shit. What he was asking me to do was to have the kind of honesty and freedom, letting Regina come forth, because a big part of his work with me was helping me to break through all my nice girl stuff. 
And when he received my letters, there was something so organic because it was just a one-on-one thing and I was having fun with him and I was just wanting to delight him. But then immediately afterwards, I wanted to make it appropriate. So he has taught me so many lessons just in the way he worked with me about the practice of writing. And one of the big, big practices is if I'm writing to try and please everybody and make everything nice and make it, you know, all acceptable to people, it doesn't have the same transformational possibility because I'm not letting myself hang out with it. I'm not letting myself be honest to myself. And I know Mary has you have many examples <laughs> of him giving you that kind of feedback. Definitely. So I think that if I were to say anything about the transformational possibility of writing, I'd like to say that writing has the same transformational possibility that prayer has. So from the Catholic Christian tradition that I come from, And if you read the catechism, it will tell you how many types of prayer are there. And they'll say, oh, there are four types of prayer. There's prayer of supplication, begging. You're asking for something. Well, there's a way in which we can use our writing to articulate the deepest needs of our heart. Imagine giving yourself the prompt and just sitting there with blank pages and saying, If nobody's watching, if nobody cares, if I'm the only one here, what is the deepest, deepest calling? What is my truest heart's longing? This is very powerful. This is prayer of supplication. This is prayer of articulating what it is that we need, what we have passion for, and what we're begging for. I once wrote a book about prayer, and I was really poo-pooing the whole idea of begging God for stuff. And then when I revised the book 10 years later, I changed that chapter completely because I recognized that this prayer of supplication was really important. And if we need anything in this day and age, it's to beg, to beg our own being and the love of the world and God, whatever that means to us to grace us and to come forth and to step into the lives of those who are suffering. And another type of prayer was the prayer of thanksgiving. You all know about the practices of gratitude. You write five things at the end of the day. That is transformational writing. Writing as a transformational process. You sit down every night and you just write five things that you're grateful for in the course of that day. People tell you, and if you've done it yourself, you know what that does. It just, it changes everything. It changes you from being somebody who looks for the dark side into somebody who just imagines and recognizes what's good. Gratitude is the heart of prayer, Brother David Stendhal Rost says. Gratitude is the heart of prayer. And then there's the prayer of celebration, exaltation, praise. Lee was really wanting us to live a life of praise. Praise only praise, he would say. And Yogi Ram Surat Kumar would say the same thing. Does that mean that he was turning his back on the world's suffering? Absolutely not, not at all. But for our transformation, he was inviting us to invoke praise as our way of being. And that's what he was doing in his poetry to Yogi Ram Surat Kumar, on and on and on, praising everything. So I can speak from my experience and the teachings that I got from Lee about the transformational possibilities of writing. The thing is, and some of the great writers have said this, you write to find out what you know, not because you know. You pose the question and you start by saying, I don't know what God is, but I have a hint that it could be this, or I have a hint that it might be that. I don't know what it means to have consciousness or awareness. Let me just explore this. It's possible that it could be this. And really engage yourself in a process of exploration, curiosity. Yes, you can do this in your head. Yes, you can do this sitting on your meditation cushion. And it's really great to put it down, to put it down and actually sew it onto your page because you have to slow down to really be truthful. So is writing a transformational path? Yes. 
our famous Natalie Goldberg, who's written a million books about writing and all these wonderful prompts and all the workshops she does and on and on. Her teacher was the Zen master, Katagiri Roshi. And people used to come every day to come and sit meditation and they come to long sessions where they'd be sitting for days on end. And he told her, your practice is writing. Your practice is writing. She wasn't just writing about carrots or the latest car. She was diving deep into existential questions and also about what would be useful to human beings and also creating poetry that opened up like flowers opening up. And she also wrote an incredible biography about her life with him, Long Quiet Highway. And it was her biography of her time with Katagiri Roshi. And then, sadly, when some information was shared about his life and some of the indiscretions of his life, she also wrote after that and talked about how that pain of that had affected her life and her relationship. So she never stopped. She's still doing it. She's still doing it. She's still writing, giving workshops. She's probably in her 70s. Well, so what we'd like to do is engage in some writing with you tonight. We're going to begin with something very short that's not actually writing. It's more of a making a list, but it's priming the pump for what's going to come next. One of the things that we do as writers is we really work a lot in the field of life with the pairs of opposites that life is made up of. So we know what those are day and night, sunrise and sunset, bravery and fear, courage and fear, let's say, freedom and slavery, birth and death, fullness and emptiness. On the spiritual path, being nobody versus being somebody. These are pairs of opposites. Individual, for me, this is one that I've been really sitting with for years now. What about taking care of my individual needs, my individual sadhana versus my service to the group? So individual and group. Here's another pair of opposites. Hope and hopelessness. There's Mm -hmm. another pair. Good and evil, of course. War and peace. It goes on and on. True and false, et cetera, et cetera. So everybody has a lot of pairs of opposites in our lives. And wherever those are at play, should I go or should I stay? Mm. Should I make this change? Should I sell my house or should I stay here? These are very, very powerful places where we're in the fire with our lives and our spiritual path, our journey, our spiritual journey through life. And there's a tremendous amount of power, energy, the conflict itself, the fire and friction. This is alchemical. And so we say, and some of this comes from the work of the psychologist C.G. Jung, that if you stay in the tension between the opposites and you don't try to either or, you really stay both and, that there's this transcendent third that can come from nowhere, from everywhere, unexpected, sudden. It's a surprise. We might call it grace, or we might just call it a blessing, or we might just call it the unknown is now talking to us. But if we stay in between and we really let ourselves feel what all of that is, that something amazing might happen for us that is a completely new way of being, a new way of seeing, a new opening, something we couldn't foresee if we were in the either or the or. Mm -hmm. Does this make sense to you all? All right. Thank you. So we struggle in the friction between that yes and that no. We stay there. We wait. We have faith, even though we might be in faith and doubt. There's another pair of opposites. We just had a long discussion about that recently, faith and doubt. They're both okay in the middle ground there. But we stay there until a reconciling third element appears. So what we want to do is invite you, we're going to take five minutes and make a list of what those opposites are in your life. 
So they'll be personal for you. And they might be universal, but they're grounded in the personal so that they're real to you. They're not just concepts, you know. Capitalism and Marxism or something. <laughs> That's not what we're looking for. <laughs> yeah, we're looking for where's that alchemy at play for you? So we're going to start with that and we'll take five minutes and then we'll come back and Regina will introduce the second part where you're actually going to be doing some writing. Okay, five minutes. Okay, everybody, this list was about pairs of opposites that are at work in our lives and the alchemical friction between those two opposites. Would anybody like to share anything from your list? Yeah, some of my opposites are alone and together, town and village, staying home and adventures, mm. yes. movement and sitting, mm. Germany and America, mm. children and adults, Expectation and frustration, and ocean and mountains, and cold and hot. Oh, that's perfect. I can relate to quite a few of those personally. <laughs> Staying at home versus going out and adventuring and traveling, and many others. Yeah, because the beauty is that we want both. Yes. Anybody else want to share? Yeah, I have. Accepting or judging, holding on or letting go, creative or destructive, responsible or irresponsible, care or indifference, energy or exhaustion, outwardly focused or inwardly focused, love and hate, health or illness, alone or together active or in, inactive mm, that's great a lot of those resonate for me thank you anyone else maybe one more one or two more shares okay direct path versus what i would call sequential path writing versus music because i don't have energy for both mm. it would appear yeah. Trust in what is, as opposed to dissatisfaction. Peace versus regret. I was surprised the number of things that came up for me that I experience. Joy and seriousness. Mm. Abundance and lack. Content and restless. Grateful and needing. Strong and fearful, loving and impatient, calm and disturbed, knowing and confused, and trusting and concern. I did also have wise and foolish. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It's really great. Thank you for sharing, everybody. In listening to each other, we get to hear the common threads and we all share mm -hmm. in those. Like we can relate to everyone's opposites, even though that particular pair of opposites might not be supercharged for me right at this moment, but I know about that. I can relate because we're all human beings. Yeah, and isn't it interesting that when we had something that sounded one side positive and one side negative, not everything is positive and negative like Germany and America, that they're not positive or negative. But some things really do feel to us like, I want this, but I don't want that. Mm -hmm. And so I would suggest that when we are looking at this, we look at the fact that we have expectations and demands almost that life be this side and not that side. That we've succeeded if we got this and we failed if we got that. 
that we're good if we have abundance and that there's something wrong with us if we have lack or whatever. It's just a good inquiry. So to move on, where we're going with our longer writing, I'm going to suggest, if you wish, that we create a prayer for the world, that you individually create a prayer for the world, and that you share it with us and we declare it. And I want to give you some background on it. So don't start writing now. Just be relaxed about this because there's no way to do it wrong. Within many of the religious traditions, you know that there is this thing called call and response. The chanter calls out one line and you either repeat it or you say an opposite line of some sort. This is a type of polarity, a type of interplay in which we create harmony or some kind of product out of the opposites. And in Catholicism, we use the term litany, L-I-T-A-N-Y, in which we take the qualities or the requests and we speak them. They could be praises. You know, we have a litany in honor of Blessed Mother Mary, and we call her Star of the Sea, and we say, we love you or something. And then we say, help of Christians, help of martyrs, beautiful beyond compare. And then each time we say that, we respond. We pour our hearts out to you. Lord, have mercy. So I'm going to read you a litany that I just came across. And it's written by a Catholic priest whose name is Michael Moynihan. And he calls it the litany of contradictory things. And what he does, as you'll hear, is he places two difficulties, two forces, two things we would think are contradictory. And instead of saying, Lord, have mercy or bless us, he uses another ongoing chant type phrase to bring the two together. So please take this as prayer, perhaps join with me in prayer as I read this prayer, and then we'll use that as a jumping off place for you to do whatever you want by way of writing a prayer for the world. So this is the litany of contradictory things. Wheat and weeds, let them grow together. Arabs and Jews in Palestine, let them grow together. Greeks and Turks in the Balkans, let them grow together. Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland, let them grow together. Pros and Contras in Central America, let them grow together. The documented and the undocumented aliens, let them grow together. Immigrants and Native Americans, let them grow together. Blacks and whites, let them grow together. Sikhs and Hindus in India, let them grow together. Revolutionaries and reactionaries, let them grow together. Russians and Americans, let them grow together. Religious leaders who lay and lighten burdens, let them grow together. Disciples prone to boasts or betrayals, let them grow together. People of God who wound and heal, let them grow together. Rich and poor, humble and haughty, let them grow together. Those whose thinking is similar and contrary, let them grow together. Those whose feelings are transparent or concealed, let them grow together. Days of sparseness and days of plenty, let them grow together. Winter, spring, summer, fall, let them grow together. All the seasons of one's life, let them grow together. Joys and sorrows, laughter, tears, let them grow together. Strengths and weakness, let them grow together. Doubt and faith, let them grow together. Denial and commitment, let them grow together. Preoccupation and freedom, let them grow together. Virtue and vice, let them grow together. 
contemplation and action, let them grow together. Giving and receiving, let them grow together. The helpful and the helpless, let them grow together. Wisdom of the East and West, let them grow together. All the contrarieties of the Lord, of the earth, of creation, let them grow together. So take 10 minutes, and perhaps you'll make a litany of prayer for the world. Or perhaps you'll just be inspired to just pour out gratitude or praise or supplication. And let it be something that comes from the heart, through your arm, to your pen, to your page. And can be short, it can be long, 10 minutes. Please write a prayer for the world. Okay, everybody, our 10 minutes is up. And keep in mind that anything that you've started here in writing, you can finish, you can work on more later after this talk is over. You can keep going with it. You can, you can do anything you want. It's your work. It's your a creative process. And the other thing is, we really want you to share, even if they're the most elementary prayers, brave, generous, and undefended, and recognize that although this is a podcast, this will not be a part of the podcast without your permission. So anybody mm-hmm. want to begin? It's so beneficial to everyone. Dear Troubled and Miraculous World, Sharing a Planet of Generous Bounty, Share Your Larder Amongst One Another. Share your suffering and cruelty amongst us all. Expose your pains and fears and weakness with us all. Cry aloud in the public square. Debase yourself with your craven wants. Befriend the broken dog beside your bed so that we all may know who we are. Thank you. Prayer for the world. Whatever will happen, Yogi Ramsurat Kumar. Birth and death, Yogi Ramsurat Kumar. You or I, you and me, Yogi Ramsurat Kumar. Dark and light, Yogi Ramsurat Kumar. Fear or love, Yogi Ramsurat Kumar. Sun and moon, Yogi Ramsurat Kumar. Past and future, not now, Yogi Ram Swat Kumar. We are all one, and I am Yogi Ram Swat Kumar. Parents and children connected, Yogi Ram Swat Kumar. Old and young together in it, Yogi Ram Swat Kumar. Waking up, waking up, human race, and be humble, Yogi Ram Swat Kumar. A home for everyone, everywhere. Yogi Ram Swat Kumar. Bowing in gratitude to Mother Earth. Yogi Ram Swat Kumar. Living a life in compassion, generosity, and kindness. Yogi Ram Swat Kumar. Yogi Ram Swat Kumar. I truly feel as you're reading, both of you reading, that your prayer and our listening and participation in your prayer is going into the atmosphere of the earth. O oh Lord, may your will be done with no regard to how this individual person would have it be on this planet, one way or the other. For that is what will be done regardless of how this person would have it be done. May any shred of resistance to how anything goes on this planet, one way or the other, be dissolved in trust in you and in your divine wisdom. May any shred of resistance that may be felt by this individual person be a function of compassion for others, even if misguided. May the totality unravel in its beauty and majesty, regardless of this one's opinions and preferences. 
Yet may any opinions or preferences that this person may hold be a function of his compassion for the suffering of others in this glorious planet, even if such compassion lacks a capital C. May your will be done as it will be done in any case. Yet may the heart break open with compassion for others and this blue planet as your will unfolds the exact way that it shall. You reading your prayers on behalf of all of us. Anyone else who would like to read your prayer? I entitled it, The Courage to Coming Back. Who are we to think our words are greater or lesser than another, or our looks or our possessions? Where did our hearts go? Can we come back to the true source of our hearts, knowing and longing? Can we risk the expression of our true feelings of care for ourselves and one another? Yes, I see it happening in me and in you. Thank you for your courage. I thank me for my courage. And I thank us for answering our heart's longing. I thank us for coming back to the true source of our knowing. Answering our heart's longing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Regina and I wanted to go in this direction tonight because there are many directions that we could go in with writing, just endless possibilities. Because we've both been so moved by what is happening in the world and the necessity for us to understand that our spiritual path and what is going on in the world is one and the same. The ongoing struggles with the pandemic, the ongoing reality of climate change, and now the war in Ukraine. And we have many loved ones in Europe, dear ones who are very, very close to the action that's happening and the influx of immigrants. So we really wanted to go in this direction and thank you so much for your participation. This is so beautiful. This is really very heartfelt. Would anyone else like to share a prayer? Can you put the sharings up there so I can read them? I'll read your prayer. Okay. Let us find ways to listen. Let us find ways to be patient. Let us find ways to recognize the complications of history. Let us acknowledge that everyone is doing the best that they can. Let us be aware of all that we have in common. Let us be ready to laugh. Yes, if this is in fact one body, the earth is one body, then our prayers are actually a counterpoint, are actually a necessity, and our laughter and our seeking of beauty is actually a contribution to this one planetary body. And I want to add to that, these are some lines from one of Lee's songs. And We can imagine these lines being written to our loved one, a friend, a husband, wife, lover, partner, child. We can imagine it in our human relationships, and we can also completely know that we can speak to the divine, to God, to goddess, however we understand the God of our understanding in this same way. You're my paradox of contrasts. Sweet as honey, sweet as honey, bitter as can be. You're a puzzle I don't have to solve. Just a quick plug, uh, one of our websites, we have a wonderful westernbowl.org website where you get all these podcasts. And then we also have an HSM online, Homsage Mandir website. We're doing a monthly contemplation called the Patchwork Jacket. Before I forget it, if you want to be on a list to be contacted, if Regina and I are giving another writing workshop, and lately we've been focusing in a lot on memoir writing, 
If you'd like to be contacted, you can go through my website, which is maryangelonyoung.com through the contact and just say, I'm interested in writing workshops. And then we'll put you on our mailing list for future writing workshops. 